Let's talk about Calvinism and the enemies of Israel. Calvinism and the enemies of Israel. Put on your seatbelt, folks. Here's John Calvin. John Calvin of Calvinism said, but here he, the rabbi, not only betrays his ignorance, but his utter stupidity. Since God so blinded the whole people that they were like uh, restive dogs. I have had much conversation with many Jews. I have never seen either a drop of piety or a grain of truth or ingenuousness. Nay, I have never found common sense in any Jew. But this fellow, who seems so sharp and ingenious, displays his own impudence to his great disgrace. By the way, notice how he said that uh, God has so blinded the whole people. Really? Really? So God has blinded every Jew from now on. Well, that's interesting. How is it then that there are so many Jews that are coming to Yeshua, Messiah, and there are many Messianic Jews throughout the world and in Israel today, if they're all so blinded? Well, this is John Calvin talking. This is pure anti-Semitism. John Calvin refers to the Jews as, quote, profane, unholy, sacrilegious dogs of a, bar uh, a barbarous nation. The people of Israel rejected by God. Really? Israel's been rejected by God, has he? Well, that's interesting. Uh, if that's the case, how is it that they've returned to being a nation? May 1948, just as the scripture said, the dry bones would be gathered back together. We now know we're waiting on that breath of life to come in as enough of them become believers that there is a great revival that breaks out among them. And it's already starting in some regard. The foundation's already being laid. That's kind of funny that, a, that God has so rejected Israel, yet the prophecies related to the nation of Israel are coming true. They became a nation once again. They, in 67, were able to get control of the Temple Mount in the Six-Day War where they went after Jordan. They, of course, gave it back over to the Muslims as they shouldn't have done, but they actually legally have custody of it. They, uh, Israel, have a mighty fighting force. The Bible said that would occur. They'd be a mighty fighting force. They have one of the largest, most um, skilled uh, air force in the world. The Bible says that they would be as a garden. The, nation, the deserts of Israel would be as a garden. They're exporting fruit and flowers all over the world. The Bible says they will bless the whole world. They'll be a blessing to the whole world, Genesis 12. And yet today we see Israel is indeed blessing the world with all kinds of incredible technology from satellite, GPS, thumb drive, cellular, medical. The Bible says that they would return to being a people. They would return to their original language, the Hebrew language today. Uh, that part of the world, for so many years, Hebrew was not there. It's not only there, that's what their papers are printed in. Well, that's pretty remarkable that God has rejected the people of Israel, when yet the Bible told us these things would happen, and yet we're seeing it in our foundation as those dry bones are being reassembled, and we're waiting on the next phase. Yes, the physical restoration of Israel, and we are now waiting on the spiritual restoration of Israel. John Calvin on Augustine said this, Augustine is so holy with me that if I wish to write a confession of my faith, I could do so with all fullness and satisfaction to myself out of his writings. What you need to understand, my friends, is John Calvin, uh, you know, JC, John Calvin. I wonder who some of these people uh, have really invited into their heart. JC as in Jesus Christ or JC as in John Calvin? I think more of them have invited John Calvin into their heart. And if they're believing the gospel of John Calvin, they are lost. If they are believing the gospel as presented by John Calvin, they are lost in their sin. For John Calvin had a false gospel. He had a works gospel. John Calvin, coming out of the Catholic Church, did nothing more in reality, I believe, than give us a Protestant version of Catholicism. And many today, with their works-based Calvinism, are, and many of my friends, some of them who are pastors and are former Catholics, Protestant, Bible-believing pastors, who are former Catholics, will tell me, and they will gladly tell you, some of them have done radio and TV and books and articles, that what they read in Calvinism today is what they read as a Catholic. John Calvin just simply gave us 
uh, to the Protestant world, really Catholicism repackaged. But should we be shocked? Because he admits here that Augustine is so holy with me that if I wish to write a confession of my faith, I could do so with all fullness and satisfaction to myself out of his writings. Well, who was Augustine, folks? He was known as the Catholic's Catholic. Did you know that? He was known as the Catholic's Catholic. Look, look at what Augustine said in his book, The City of God, about the Jews. God is, has shown the church in her enemies, the Jews, the grace of his compassion, since, as saith the apostle, their offense is the salvation of the Gentiles. What did he, what's he doing there? He's quoting Romans 11 out of context. He hasn't finished the verse 28 and 29 that tells you, <laughs> as he had mercy on the Jews, uh, the, the Gentiles, he'll have mercy on the Jews. His promises to them are irrevocable. He will fulfill his promises to the Jewish fathers. You know, Calvin and Augustine don't want, neither John Piper, don't quote the verse in context, do they? But here's Augustine saying, God has shown the church in her enemies, the Jews, the grace of his compassion. Whoa! So God didn't wipe out the Jews. He's showing his compassion. But the Jews are the enemies of the church. Well, you wonder why we have people like John Piper going around declaring that the, in, the Jews are enemies of God. This is the same claptrap being, what was being promoted, the anti-Semitism being promoted by Augustine and John Calvin. Not to mention Luther. Augustine said the Jews are our attendant slaves who carry, as it were, our satchels and bear the manuscripts while we study them. When we argue with the heathen, we adduce the predictions found in the Bible written by the Jews. Augustine said the true image of the Hebrew is Judas Iscariot, who sells the Lord for silver. The Jews can never understand the scriptures and forever bear the guilt of the death of Christ. Who killed Jesus? The Bible says he laid down his life willingly as a ransom for sinners. It's amazing. They don't seem to realize there were Gentiles there, there the Romans were there, the, yes, the Jews were there. Who killed Jesus? You did. I did. That's who killed Jesus. Your sin and my sin is what killed Jesus. Your sin, my sin is why he died. And he laid down his life as a ransom for sinners. He says, I laid down my life and I can take it up again. And my friends, yet the Jews are portrayed by so many as the Christ killers. My friends, you and I, you and I are guilty as well because it was because of our sin that Christ died. Andrew Robinson says, Augustine of Hippo is the, quote, unrivaled patron saint of replacement theology, end quote. Well, my friends, you want to talk about replacement theology and its hotbed for anti-Semitism, it being a fountain for anti-Semitism, who is the father of it, the patron saint of replacement theology? Augustine. And yet, who says his theology comes directly from Augustine, the Catholic of Catholics? None other than John Calvin. In fact, look at this, February 27th, 2008, Pope Benedict, quote, With today's meeting, I wish to conclude the presentation of the figure of St. Augustine. After having dealt with dwelt on his life, works, and some aspects of his thoughts, I would like today to return to his inner experience, which made him one of Christian history's greatest converts. Last year, during my pilgrimage to Pavia to venerate the mortal remains of this father of the church, I particularly dedicated my reflection to this experience of his. By doing so, I wish to express to him the homage of the entire Catholic Church but also to manifest my personal devotion and gratitude in regard to a figure to whom I feel very linked for the role he has had in my life as a theologian, a priest, and a pastor, end quote. Who, who is saying that? Pope Benedict in 2008. Isn't that interesting? This is how Pope Benedict and the Catholic Church views Augustine, and yet John Calvin said this is who built his theology. Paul R. Wilkinson writes, quote, arguably the most influential Protestant reformer, John Calvin, expresses his indebtedness to a man so venerated by the Roman Catholic Pope, questions must be raised concerning one, Augustine's theology, two, Calvin's endorsement of Augustine's theology, and three, any endorsement by Calvin. My friends, this is a very, very serious matter. I am more and more convinced as I study Calvinism, as 
portrayed by the man whose name it bears, John Calvin, that Calvinism is indeed a theological cult, that they have perverted the gospel. They have taken the gospel and they have made it a man works gospel, not a sanctification and justification by faith, but a justification by works. One must persevere. Now, I believe that the Bible, when it, Jesus himself is speaking of the perseverance of the saints and he who perseveres to the end will be saved. That is referring to the literal perseverance, physical perseverance of the Jews during the tribulation who will come out the other side into the kingdom. It is not talking about salvation. Yet people who call themselves leaky dispensationalists, and they must call themselves leaky dispensationalists to come to that interpretation because they have broken the rules of dispensationalism, which is to use the proper tools of hermeneutics to interpret the scripture. And so they must start spiritually allegorizing and ripping things out of context to build a theology that fits their Calvinism, their tulip, the tulip of John Calvin, P, perseverance. Now, Perseverance, of course, as pr promoted by the Calvinist, John Calvin, does not allow for one to sin. Well, that's ironic because I think we can pretty much guarantee that's what was going on in the life of John Calvin with the way he behaved in Geneva and the things he did and said and wrote. But you today's Calvinists, many of them, many of them now promote a salvation or justification by works. You have to persevere to prove you're saved. John Piper says, for final salvation, we must slay sin and pursue holiness for final salvation. That's works. That's a false gospel. That is what Jesus himself warned about. Many of these people today proclaim that there's no way that a Christian can behave in a carnal manner. If they have the Lord as their Savior and the Lord of their life, they're not going to be involved in any carnal behavior. Well, it's not a good thing, but who are you performing church discipline on in Matthew 18? if not people who have behaved in a carnal manner or in a backslidden manner. The problem is Calvinism has now been taken and put on the scriptures and they twist the scriptures for their presupposition of John Calvin's tulip or theology. And so my friends, I believe that Calvinism in its form as promoted by John Calvin is a false gospel. It has a form of godliness while denying the power thereof. It has a form of godliness while denying the power thereof. In fact, I believe that Calvinism today is very likely a part of the great apostasy as it is rising quickly, particularly this neo-Calvinism. Now, there are my, some of my friends who call themselves Calvinist. I have a friend of mine who's a pastor in California of a small church, and I have had many conversations with his wife and him over the years uh, and uh, said, now, do you agree with John Calvin and the tulip and what it teaches? No, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with limited atonement. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Yeah, oh, or does that just mean the elect? Or does that mean the world? Christ died for the world. It's available to all, but only applicable to those who, through faith and repentance, receive Christ through faith. But you see, my friends, the Calvinist, as defined by John Calvin, would say, no, Jesus didn't die for the whole world. Limited atonement. Well, I would say, do you agree with that? No, I don't agree with that. Do you agree with this idea of perseverance? You've got to persevere to be saved because if you do, that's works. No, I don't agree with that. Well, wait a minute. We're going through the tulip. You're not agreeing with a lot of it, yet you want to call yourself a Calvinist. My friends, you can't rewrite Calvinism and call yourself a Calvinist. My friend, this pastor no longer calls himself a Calvinist. Now, there were those who maybe identified with Reformed theology that were dispensationalist, people like Charles Ryrie and others that I have great respect for, and they believed in free grace. Uh, and so some of them didn't want to refer to themselves per se as Calvinists, but maybe Reformed. But that is a problem itself. If you say you're into Reformed theology, what does that mean? You believe in infant baptism? You believe in replacement theology? What does that mean? You believe in dominion theology? What does that mean? That's a loaded term. Really, my friends, what we need to do is get away from these terms. And if you don't agree with anti-Zionism, you don't agree with anti-Semitism, if you don't agree with replacement theology, if you don't agree with dominion theology, if you don't agree with social justice, then you need to quit calling yourself a Calvinist because clearly you're not a Calvinist. And again, those who say, well, they're dispensationalist and a Calvinist, that's an oxymoron. 
because Calvinism is about taking scripture out of context, a lot of spiritual allegorizing going on, whereas dispensationalism is about interpreting the scripture according to certain standard and consistent house rules of interpretation. So really to say that you're a dispensationalist and a Calvinist is an oxymoron. And I believe what's very interesting is that Calvinism has deceived many. The Bible says even the elect will be deceived if it were possible. I'm seeing many people today awaken to the dangers of Calvinism as taught by John Calvin. And so my friends, what's interesting is those who claim to be the elect, many of them are proving they're not the elect because they have been deceived. Because the Bible says even the elect would be deceived if it were possible. Notice those who haven't been deceived. Notice those who have come out of it. Notice those who have rejected it. But notice those who have embraced it. Those who have embraced it, this false gospel, this works gospel, well, they run around talking all the time about the elect. The fact that they are embracing it wholeheartedly and jumping into the theology of John Calvin, to me, proves they're not the elect. Or they simply need to grow and mature in their faith a little more and figure this out, and time will tell, which they do. But this is a very serious and growing problem. And I believe that much of Calvinism today, as taught from the standpoint of John Calvin, is preparing the way for a false religious system of Antichrist by promoting dominion theology, replacement theology, social justice, and many of these things. Now, granted, there's a neo-Calvinism today, but reality is, if you did not have the bad hermeneutics and bad theology of traditional John Calvin Calvinism, you wouldn't have neo-Calvinism. Neo-Calvinism was built on the back of John Calvin's Calvinism because of poor interpretation of the scripture and spiritually allegorizing much of the text. So this is very serious and very dangerous. Here's what Martin Luther said of the Jews. He said, quote, first, and this was in his book titled Of the Jews and Their Lies, 1543. First, their synagogue should be set on fire. Secondly, their home should likewise be broken down and destroyed. Thirdly, they should be deprived of their prayer books and Talmud. He went on to say, fourthly, their rabbis must be forbidden under threat of death to teach anymore. Fifthly, passport and traveling privileges should be absolutely forbidden to the Jews. Sixthly, they ought to be stopped from usury. Seventhly, let the young and strong Jews and Jewesses be given the flail, the axe, the hoe, the spade, the distaff, and spindle, and let them earn their bread by the sweat of their noses. We ought to drive the rascally lazy bones out of our system. Therefore, away with them. To sum up, dear princes and nobles who have Jews in your domains, if this advice of mine does not suit you, then find a better one so that you and we may all be free of this insufferable devilish burden, In quote. My friends, that could have been written by Adolf Hitler. In fact, Adolf Hitler quoted Luther again and again. Luther and what he taught, John Calvin, what he taught, many of the reformers laid the foundation for the anti-Semitism that spilled into the reformed churches, the Calvinist churches that made up what was called the German Christians that dissolved their denominations, united under the right bishop, handpicked by Adolf Hitler. My friend, Dr. Andy Woods, in this excellent book entitled Ever Reforming, and by the way, I highly recommend the book Ever Reforming. Some of these quotes I'm giving you tonight are in this book. Another one I highly recommend is called Israel Betrayed, Volume 2, The Rise of Christian Palestinianism. Now, I get nothing for, for promoting these books other than an educated listening audience. Israel Betrayed, Volume 2, The Rise of Christian Palestinianism by Paul R. Wilkinson. This is a very excellent book. Excellent book. Many of my quotes tonight have come from that. I also highly recommend the book by Olivier Melnick, In Times Anti-Semitism. In Times Anti-Semitism. Of course, you can watch the TV show of Andy Woods and Olivier Melnick at WVWTV.com. We produce their TV show right from this news desk. WVWTV.com. Another book I highly recommend is that of my friend, the late David Hunt. Dave Hunt wrote an excellent book entitled, What Love Is This? And in fact, at the very opening of the book, he talks about having dinner with young people uh, and talking about Calvinism. And uh, my friends, 
uh, that was my wife and I and few friends who sat and had dinner with him in Milwaukee at the end of our Worldview Weekend many years ago. So I highly recommend What Love Is This? refuting much of the false teaching of John Calvin. So these are very important books. Dave Hunt's What Love Is This? Andy Wood's Ever Reforming, Olivier Melnick, End Times Anti-Semitism, and Paul Wilkinson's book, Israel Betrayed, The Rise of Christian Palestinianism. And you can go online and find those, I'm sure, on the various websites. But listen to what Dr. Woods says about this. Luther. He says, in that same year, Luther also wrote a pamphlet called Of the Unknowable Name and the Generations of the Messiah. In it, he calls the Jews little devils. Then in 1546, he preached his final four sermons in Eselben, calling the Jews the enemies of Christianity and calling them for them to be kicked out of the country, end quote. Olivier Melnick writes, quote, In 1543, when the Jewish community didn't meet his expectations, Luther published the book of the Jews and their lies, where his description of the Jewish people is so venomous that Hitler was quoted saying that he was just finishing up what Luther started. As a matter of fact, many scholars and historians believe that Luther's view of the Jews had a profound effect on Germans for centuries to come and also had a serious influence on Hitler's ideology and implementing the final solution to the Jewish question. The connection between Luther and Hitler is not difficult to make, end quote. Dr. Tommy Ice has said, quote, Hitler was not alone in his irrational desire to murder Jews. It was embedded in the German, Austrian, and Eastern European nations. The original source for such anti-Semitism goes back to the common experience of all of Europe's medieval Roman Catholic Jew hatred. Most of the people throughout Europe did not have to be taught by Hitler or the Nazis to hate the Jews. It was an epidemic in their culture for hundreds of years. When the Nazis crystallized their anti-Semitism into murdering the Jews as a virtue, they already had a willing mass of people ready to join their crusade. After all, Hitler quoted the founder of the Reformation three times in Mein Kampf, that would be Luther, and called Martin Luther one of the greatest Christians in all history. It is not surprising, for the most part, the German clergy were great Hitler enthusiast, since almost all of them were liberal and held to replacement theology. This is such a problem with what Luther taught that the Lutheran World Federation in 1984 put out this statement to their credit, quote, we Lutherans take our name and much of our understanding of Christianity from Martin Luther, but we cannot accept or condone the violent verbal attacks that the reformer made against the Jews. The sins of Luther's anti-Jewish remarks, the violence of his attacks on the Jews must be acknowledged with deep distress and all occasions for similar sin in the present or the future must be removed from our churches. Lutherans of today refuse to be bound by all of Luther's utterances on the Jews." End quote. Did you know that Martin Luther published a Bible? And in 1522, in his New Testament, he said this and wrote this, quote, I miss more than one thing in this book, referring to Revelation, and this makes me hold it to be neither apostolic nor prophetic. I think of it almost as I do the fourth book of Estros and can in no way detect that the Holy Spirit produced it. It is just the same as if we did not have it, and there are many far better books for us to keep. Finally, let everyone think of it as his own spirit give him to. My spirit cannot fit itself into this book. Again, referring to Revelation. There is one sufficient reason for me not to think highly of it. Christ is not taught or known in it. But to teach Christ is the one thing which an apostle is bound above all else to do. As he says in Acts 1, ye shall be my witnesses. Therefore, says Martin Luther, I stick to the books which give me Christ clearly and purely, end quote. Well, obviously he's an ignoramus because what is Revelation about if not Christ who is seen over and over and over again? Dr. Andy Woods writes, apparently Luther rejected the book of Revelation as being the product of divine inspiration. In fact, in 1545, Luther printed the book of Revelation along with Hebrews, James, and Jude as an appendix to the New Testament, end quote. Paul Wilkinson, in this excellent book again that I highly recommend, Israel Betrayed, 
subtitled The Rise of Christian Palestinianism. He writes this, The Christian Palestinianist campaign to theologically destroy Israel, underpinned as it is by Augustinian allegorist and Calvinistic amillennialism, is a clear symptom of the end times apostasy within the church and a clear signpost to the second coming of Jesus Christ, end quote. Those are strong words, but I agree wholeheartedly with them that what we are seeing coming from John Calvin, from Augustine, and this um, replacement theology is indeed apostasy within the church.